Hi, I'm Nancy Bell, the Reader's Advisory Librarian here at Oshkosh Public Library, and this is the second video in our Freedom to Read video series. As promised, this week we're talking about the history of Banned Books Week. Um, it was established in 1982. That was a while ago. Why are we still talking about this? Um, so Banned Books Week is an annual awareness campaign drawing attention to banned and challenged books and celebrating our freedom to read. You know, it took us a long time to get where we are, even though 1982 is 40 years ago now. Uh, censorship is a centuries-old issue. Over 200 years ago, in 1791, the United States passed the First Amendment. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of a religion, or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. Whereas today, where it seems we're mostly concerned about children specifically reading inappropriate material, the United States did pass the Comstock Act of 1873, which affected everyone. This law made it a crime to mail obscene materials or advertisements or information about obscene materials. And I keep throwing obscene in quote marks because at this point in history, obscene included information about abortion, contraception, um, and we were really actually still using the British definition and officially made the ruling to keep using it in 1896 um, in the Rosen versus United States case. Uh, and that definition defined a work to be obscene if the material had the tendency to deprave or corrupt those whose minds are open to such immoral influences and into whose hands a publication of this sort may fall. It's vague, right? And very subjective. Um, and so we've had this long history of trying to more specifically define the word obscene and it changes throughout history. Um, we recently use something called the Miller test, I believe, um, and so under, under the Comstock Act, though, and then this legal definition of obscene, we were considering works to be obscene and illegal if any part of that work was obscene. So in 1922, for example, James Joyce's Ulysses was being published weekly, a chapter at a time, in a literary magazine. And one of those chapters was considered obscene. So the United States Postal Service seized and burned issues of the magazine. The publishers were actually convicted and fined, and publication of Ulysses stopped for 11 years until 1933, which is when it was finally established uh, in a Supreme Court case that an entire work, rather than just a portion of it, should be considered for the work to be declared obscene. So quick side note, you'll note that we're not actually using the word pornography. And that's because it doesn't have a legal definition. So when we're referring to the First Amendment, pornography is actually protected speech, while obscenity is not. Except for child pornography, it is never protected or okay. And many laws are actually in place uh, for the purpose of protecting children specifically. And technically, the Comstock Act was never fully repealed. Um, there were a long series of different court cases that overturned different portions of the Comstock Act, which really chipped away at it piece by piece, um, and it's been widely considered defunct by the mid-1960s. But then through the 1970s into the 1980s, there was a surge of First Amendment court cases, um, starting with Todd versus Rochester Community Schools in 1972. Um, and in that court case, it was decided Slaughterhouse Five by Kurt Vonnegut could not be banned from libraries and classrooms of Michigan schools. The most notable case of this time period is Pico versus Board of Education Island Trees. Um, in February of 1976, the school district removed nine books in response to a parent group complaint. Five students, including 17-year-old Stephen Pico, whose name is on the case, um, the youngest of these five students only being 13 years old, uh, they joined together and challenged the school board's decision to remove the books. This court case drags out until finally in 1982. It is the first Supreme Court case to consider the right to receive information in a library setting under the First Amendment. And the Supreme Court rules that the power of school officials is limited when attempting to remove books from libraries because of their diversity of ideas. 
And so it's these two concepts, the rights to receive information and not removing books because of diverse content, these are really the basis of our freedom to read. And in 1982, in response to the surge of court cases and then the final Supreme Court ruling in the Pico case, the American Booksellers Association put on this shocking exhibit for their annual conference uh, in Anaheim, California. They put 500 books behind locked bars and they had signs up saying, caution, some people consider these books dangerous. Uh, with the success of that exhibit, the American Booksellers Association invited the American Library Association, as well as other literary associations, to join a brand new initiative, Banned Books Week. So if you learned something new about Banned Books Week, uh, go ahead and like this video, maybe leave a comment about what you learned. I'll include a link to our Freedom to Read webpage in the description below for more information about how you can celebrate your freedom to read with us here at Oshkosh Public Library. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next week.